for giving me the opportunity to present here and inviting me. Uh, so this is going. This is a joint work uh, with uh, Borna Saha, and we are both assistant professors in uh, College of Information and Computer Sciences, which is newly built in UMass Amherst. Now, uh, in, so I'm going to talk about interactive algorithm modes and class and community about community reaction less. Although I had a really uh, nice ground set up uh, by Bruce uh, in the in the talk before. Um, so I'm going to talk mostly about interactive algorithm for unsupervised, canonical unsupervised planning problems like clustering. And uh, what are interactive algorithms? They are different from the traditional learning methods in the way that algorithm designer or the agent can have a say in the data collection process. So they can interactively <coughs> choose where to query or what to, what to level, which data to be level. It will become clear as we go forward. Um, and so I have to follow up to really nice talks, and it's almost lunch. It's lunch time, and I'm usually jet lag. So to remedy all of this, I put a lot of color. Try to well, not a lot, some color in my slides. So let's start with uh, the clustering problem that we are going to study. So uh, in the simplest possible scenario, we have n points. and suppose there are k clusters. We might or might not know k, and we have to clustered this endpoint. We don't know any other information about this point, about this set of points that are given to us. Now, on the other hand, we have access to some clustering oracles. So this guy either knows the ground truth clustering, if there is any, or um, it can perform some optimization algorithm, such as a k-means uh, algorithm, to know the clustering. And it can answer pairwise queries of the form whether any two given points belong to same cluster or not. So it's a same cluster query oracle. Right now, we want to ask queries to the oracle, and at the same time, we want to perform the clustering. And we want to ask minimum number of queries for this task. Right? So that's the query complexity. So what would be the query complexity for this problem? That's, that's what we are asking. So n points that are given to us, and suppose there are k clusters. Now, why do you want to do clustering in this way? And the reason is that it is somewhat motivated by recent application of crowdsourcing in entity resolution. So just give you a little bit of motivation for this. Um, we came to know, study this problem from this entity resolution, which is a well-known problem in databases. So there is a lot of very large data sets, um, like say the geographic data. So there is this DBLP, which uh, of a, which is a database of authors, we can think of like thousands and millions of authors actually. Um, so this is modeled as a graph, each node is a data record, and then there will be edges between two levels which denote the similarity between records there. And now we want to do entity resolution, meaning that there are some entities, some two records that might refer to the same entity. So if you go and start for, start for authors in this DBLP, you will see that sometimes there are two pages for the same author. This happens with mostly like East Asian names, uh, authors with East Asian names, because there are many of them. And what we want to do is to do this type of entity resolution. And this is a well-defined task, and there is a huge literature starting from some early work of Pedagogy and Center in the 60s. And it is difficult to solve correctly by any automated process. It's wide open, many here, variety of papers came out, comes out. So here is the problem, an example of a problem. And why I'm just going to show you why crowdsourcing is useful here. So suppose I have this five record. And um, I know because I have been through these places uh, that there are actually two of them, two distinct elements that represent this five record. So the first three, R1, R2, R3, the Disney World, which is in Florida, and R4 and R5 is the World Disney Park that is uh, in California, right? But for us, if you do, so there are like two, there are n elements over here, n is five, but k is two, so k cluster, two clusters. But for an automated process, all of this would seem very similar, uh, and they would be able to fail to distinguish between them or do a wrong clustering. However, humans have better knowledge, better um, some kind of domain knowledge in this scenario and uh, they can do better at detecting these entities. So why don't we 
outsources, uh, this crowdsource this clustering method. And we ask pairwise queries to the crowd or the oracle, and we ask whether two of the points are the same entity or not. And the goal is to improve ER uh, quality. Uh, however, we cannot ask overly complicated question, or we cannot just give them the entire clustering problem and say that solve it, because the crowd is not going to work for that long for you. So they can only answer simple questions, so pairwise queries are kind of ideal. And we want to minimize such pairwise number of queries because we cannot ask uh, like these questions, uh, the crowd workers cost money. So, and then the question is how are we going to set up our queries? Because uh, we might ask a variety, ask these queries in a variety of ways. So let's just say the same Disneyland example. So as I said, R1, R2, R3 is one cluster. R4, R5 is another cluster over there. Now suppose we ask this type of edge queries. Are these two clusters in the same, uh, these two points in the same cluster? Uh, ordered by these numbers in the edges. This, then we ask this query, then we ask this query, and then we ask this query. And the answer to the first three is going to be yes, and the fourth one is going to be no. Right? And we will be able to resolve the clustering problem over here. However, we could have taken a different ordering as well. We could have asked between R1 and R4. I think it's actually pretty hard to see in the screen. But so this is again R1, R2, R3. This is R4 and R5. So suppose this is our querying order, these numbers on these edges. So this is the first edge we query, then this is the second edge. And uh, in this ordering we took, this is basically the worst case ordering, we took nine queries to resolve the clustering. So how we ask these queries, that matters. So this is a clear example of the problem where that we want to study clear practical examples. So we have a clustering problem, and we are asking a oracle, which is the crowd. And we want to minimize, we want to come up with a strategy that minimizes the number of queries. So what would be the optimal number of queries here? If we just have the, if we just know there are n points and we have such a such an oracle. So if the number of clusters is k, t is actually n times k. Is that, uh, is that clear how, how that would work? Right, so we have n points k clusters, so n k queries are always sufficient. Why? Because you one by one. Um, so at the at, at the beginning you don't have the clusters, right? And you can only ask pairwise queries. Okay. It's not that you can ask for labels, right? But you are very close. So you, what you can do is actually an adaptive version of what you were saying. So the first point comes. You can start a new cluster with this point. The second point, yes. No other side information available. At this point, only this. Yes. Yeah, so the second second point come and you can so the with the first point you start a new cluster. Just complete that. Yeah, for the second point you can just make one query with this one. If it is in the same cluster, put it together, otherwise start a new cluster. And then you just do the same thing. You anytime a new point comes, you can, you can just I think I need to be away from this wall so that the, the feedback is reduced. Yes. Uh, right. <laughs> so so at the ith step of the algorithm, the ith point came, you just make a query with all of the existing clusters. And then if it is belong, it doesn't belong to any of them, you just start a new cluster with this. So you don't even have to know how many clusters are there. But you are not going to ask more than k queries for any of the points. So with nk queries, it would be done. Now, uh, if you have this kind of deterministic strategy, you can pretty easily show that this nk is also a lower bound. Because if you are asking anything less than n times k, I can always come up with a clustering instance and fool your deterministic algorithm. You can come up with some randomized scheme, and even then I will be able to fool you because I can just randomly, or so it's basically using Yao's min max type schema. So um, I can fool you even then. So I can just randomly permute my clustering instance, and you will be able, if you don't do say nk over two queries, I can make you uh, wrong with probability half. Right? So nk is also a lower bound here. So you need about nk queries to do to solve this task. 
Um, what we are going to do is to show that a little bit of side information. If we had some more information about these points, I can make this hugely sublinear in n. <coughs> so I can make this nk, the total query complexity, which is nk, go to something like k squared log. So that is one of the main results that we are going to show. Is this clear? Any questions? There are no erroneous answers from the crowd. Uh, we, that's very uh, realistic to assume that we can get erroneous uh, answers and we will include that in the model if one of the <coughs> Right. Uh, right. Now all of the clustering problems that we we have usually comes with a similarity matrix. Like for example in the case of K means clustering we have a distance matrix. Or there are some other similarity matrices. So what we will use is a similarity matrix, a model for similarity matrix, and we will show that under that model of similarity matrix uh, we can use uh, much less number than nk queries and resolve the clustering problem. Okay, and here are some reference of whatever I just said. So this type of machine human mixed model for crowdsource entity resolutions where the machines come up with a similarity matrix and then you can use the similarity matrix to design your queries in an ad hoc manner. Those type of things have been studied in the database community for last um, seven, eight years. And there is this work by Davidson that shows this NK lower bound. And uh, there is a recent work uh, last year, NIPS, that shows that if you have a K means clustering instance, and if you're allowing, you need to do about at least log n queries to, to make it to, so K means usually is, called, is uh, NP hard. But if you may, they show that if you do certain number of queries, some for n to the power epsilon, where epsilon is a small number, if you make that many queries, then uh, then you can solve this solve k means in polynomial time. Okay, so these are the prior work that has happened in this area. Okay, so what we are going to do in this talk is to tell you about the motivation of the problem, which we already did. Then we will introduce this model of similarity matrix that will help us reduce the query complexity. We will give a lower bound on whatever is the query complexity required under this model of site information. And we will give you an interactive Monte Carlo algorithm that achieves this lower bound closely. And the algorithm is also parameter free. So in that, for that algorithm, you do really don't have to know this model of side information, the model parameter. And you don't also don't have to know the number of clusters. We'll show what are the connection of this to popular community detection models, like stochastic love model. We'll introduce the fact that you, the crowd can give you noisy answers, so the faulty oracle. Uh, this will have some connection with the space bounded stochastic love model. There are some connections with correlation clustering. I don't know how much of this I will be able to cover, but I'm hoping to at least tell you about this faulty oracle and noisy query thing. And there are some other things that are quite, quite close to my heart, but I don't think I'm going to get time in this talk. But we can talk offline about this. Right. So similarity matrix. That, is, uh, that comes uh, with the clustering, and we can think of this as a part of the input. So what would be an ideal, ideal similarity matrix? In an ideal similarity matrix, it would be an n by n matrix, and um, n by n matrix w, and wij will be 1 if i and j belong to the same cluster, it will be 0 otherwise. So that's the ideal similarity matrix. What we are getting is a noisy version of this similarity matrix. So if you are given this similarity matrix, you, so you you can just find the cluster by looking at the connected component in this graph. Right? What we are getting a noisy version of this. And here is the model of uh, noisy similarity matrix. So it's again a matrix, W, I, J are the elements. And if I and J belong to the same cluster, then W, I, J is sampled from some distribution F plus. And if they belong to different cluster, then WIJ comes from, is sampled from some other distribution. So that's our assumption. So if F plus is equal to F minus, then there is no side information. 
and our similarity matrix is completely useless. So we are assuming that there is a little gap between S plus and S minus. So we are showing, we will show you a little bit of, as long as there is a little gap, and we will quantify this gap, as long as there is a little gap between S plus and S minus, we can ask a number of queries and can recover the cluster. Right? Make sense? Uh, is it clear of the model of simulator matrix that we have? Yes? What is S plus and S minus? Two arbitrary distributions. Say supported by, with some finite support. But nodes, right? Uh, no, the algorithm designer doesn't know S plus or S minus. Yeah. So that would make the algorithm design really challenging, but it would be practical. Um, on the other hand, for the case of lower bound, we can assume that they are known. Because we are just lower bounding. Okay? Um, S plus and S minus are two distributions. Two actual distributions. Yes. So you have this matrix, this W matrix. And uh, yeah, as, I, as, I, as I said, if two points are in the same cluster, for that corresponding edge, you, whether that edge exists or not, like if, if you think of this S plus or S minus in that way, S plus signifies a distribution of that edge when they are from the same cluster and S minus is the same. Right. supports have to overlap in some form, right? If they don't, the supports don't overlap, then you go back to the... Yeah, I mean, if the support don't overlap, then you go back to the... Uh, yeah, the support completely overlap. It will be fully overlap. I mean, it so as, as I said, that uh, uh, as long as... So that's not a problem if the supports do not overlap. So we... We are in, uh, I mean, we will face problem if they are very close, right? So they might have same support, but they can still be pretty different, right? Yeah. Right, and this is actually nothing but a slight generalization of the stochastic block model, because in the stochastic block model, this S plus and S minus are, I'm not talking, like, I, I will not define stochastic block model again, because it has already been defined in the previous talk, but Stochastic block model, so edges form between points of the same cluster with probability P, and edges form between points of the different cluster with, say, some probability Q. And you can generalize to like PIJs and Q, QIJs, where uh, IJ are the cluster index. Right, so so if, if F plus is boundary P and F minus is boundary Q, so this is, this is just the stochastic block model. Yes. Arbitrary, no, I'm assuming, so in stochastic, so that's actually a major difference from the stochastic block model literature because most of this work that I have listed here um, and many others, they assume that the cluster sizes either, for the case of two clusters, they're equally sized or there is some prior distribution on the cluster, some prior probability of the cluster. So this is only the uh, prior information that's supplied before the query. Or is it sampling so only the this matrix is supplied to you, this W matrix. And then you query, when you query, you get perfect information about it. When you query, you get perfect information, yes. Yes. So as if I'm given the stochastic block model matrix, and instead of asking for threshold in this for recovery, I'm saying, okay, you can now adaptively ask a few queries, and maybe the stochastic block model threshold will change now. Maybe I'll be able to recover communities where, where I wouldn't be before. So this can be used to detect outliers. Which is that, uh, uh, there are individuals who don't belong to any community also. Right? You just have to increase k. Yes, yes. Yeah. So my cluster sizes are arbitrary at this point. <coughs> okay, so here are the main results. Let me just not go over this. This is summarized over here. Um, because, but there are a lot of SLN deltas which are kind of hidden on the drug and you, can, you have to read the full theorem statement to know this. But here is the gist of it. When there is no side information, you know that the lower and upper bound matches, it's order of nk. But now I have some side information in terms of this similarity matrix. Then my lower bound is 
t square t square over the square Dillinger distance between s plus and s minus. For the square Dillinger distance, the divergence is defined like this. It's, it's a pretty standard yes, divergence measure, measure, distance measure between two distributions. That's the bicharic coefficient. Yes. <laughs> yes. And the upper bound or the algorithmic result that we have is this. It's about a log n factor away from the lower bound. Although I think our so so, but you see, this is much less than n k, so it's not growing with n anymore. It's not scaling with n linearly anymore. It's scaling only logarithmically. And k potentially can be much smaller. So we are asking much less number of queries. As long as the as long as this two uh, these two distributions are epsilon and a constant distance away in terms of the linear divergence, then um, we basically reduce it, then this would be a constant and we reduce it to k square log n from n k. Are you looking for perfect recovery? Yes, we are looking for exact recovery. Yes, with high probability. And this, this is achieved by a Monte Carlo algorithm, so it's basically high probability recovery. Okay, the better results if you were to loosen the system? Um, I, I'm not, I, actually, they, in, the mo, in most of the regimes, we will not. But I don't know what would happen in the like, very precise regime of stochastic block model where we go to this connectivity, this connectivity threshold, A log n over n, B log n over n. Uh, so you can fix it. So if you ask this many queries, so you can fix have this fixed query budget, and you can ask that many queries and guarantee that with high probability you have recovered them. K is unknown. K is unknown for the algorithm. Um, well, someone just gives you this cue, this this thing, right? K is unknown. Yeah, yeah, but someone is giving you this some. You don't have to know k, right? So someone gives you some some q queries to perform. If q is this, then you are fine. Yes. Lower bound, I assume no full knowledge. Full knowledge of s plus s minus. Even if you know s plus and s minus, you will be able to do this. Log n bound is similar to similar to in this best form I think. Yeah, this kind of thing can only be improved when you somehow bring in the fact that you don't know H2 in your lower bound. Right. So knowledge of H2 probably is important, not exact as plus as minus improving the lower bound. That's that's true, yes. So even for the algorithm, actually if we know the difference between S plus and this divert F H of S plus that should that would have made a difference. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, you will still need k square log in by this. Yeah. I don't think I don't think this bound. I think this is correct. I think our, our lower bound is loose. This log in should be in here. And the problem that we cannot bring in log in is that we can couldn't. It's an interactive algorithm, right? So we adaptively getting information. So we couldn't use something. Couldn't have a nice setup where we can use something like Sano or something standard. No, the similarity matrix is given, so Oracle is perfect. So you are given the full similarity matrix, and now you can look at the similarity matrix and ask uh, ask the Oracle the perfect answer, like whether there is an edge or not. And you want to minimize that type of crowdsourcing. So you don't use sequence of queries using the similarity Yes, you want to design a similar sequence of queries using the similarity matrix. So now let me tell you how the lower bound works and then how the upper bound works. So the main challenge of the lower bound is to do this in this interactive setting. <coughs> right, so let's go, like, there are some simple steps. So if the, 
the problems become, the clustering become difficult if there are many small size clusters. Like if there are, uh, because if you have small size cluster, then from the similarity matrix, you don't have enough evidence between you behind any, any clustering, enough witness uh, behind any clustering, right? Because there are many small size cluster, if you just look at the, so you only get to see few samples from the similarity matrix of this random variables f plus or f minus, right? Uh, but if the sizes are really small, like uh, really small, uh, then you can just do all the queries among themselves and resolve it fully. So there is some middle sweet point and that point is this one over Hellinger divergence. So suppose you have like one big cluster that you don't care about and then there are say k minus one small cluster, each of size one over Hellinger square between f plus and f minus, right? Now, one big one and k minus one. Yeah, suppose if there is, suppose instead of clustering, just think of assignment of a point to one of the clusters, right? And suppose you have one big cluster and I don't worry about that cluster. And then there are, there are k minus one small cluster. Now you have a new point and you want to assign to one of these clusters. Right? So this is straightforward a hyperbaric testing type pro uh, problem because you, this can come from this one, this one, or any, any of these k minus one situations. And for each of these uh, hyperbaric, I can have a different distribution of the similarity matrix that I'm seeing. They are all same size, one over k squared. Suppose that was my answer. Right. So this is a k minus one hyperbaric testing problem. And then I, I plan to use this hypothesis testing, some door bound on hypothesis testing. So suppose P1 is when the new element is, uh, the similarity matrix follows the distribution P1 when the new element is in cluster one, P2 when the new element is in cluster two. So I want to distinguish between this K minus one different distributions. Um, however, if this PIs, if they are close enough, I will not be able to distinguish. That, that's the standard hypothesis testing argument, right? So any hypothesis testing not to fail, that some distance, say total variation distance between <coughs> PI and PJ must be large. So if you look at the distance between PI and PJ, um, the total variation distance, you can upper bound by Hellinger divergence, uh, like some standard uh, S divergence, uh, inequalities between S divergence. Uh, but now this Selinger distance between what are P1 and P2, uh, these are actually um, distribution of the similarity matrices, right? Um, now, since the clusters are of small sizes, you are not going to see the samples uh, more than the size of the, a number of samples more than the size of the clusters. So for each of the, to, to assign assign this one element to this cluster, if you look at the similarity matrix, you are basically going to see all the edge values from this point to the elements in this cluster. So that is your number of evidence, right? So the number of samples that you are seeing. That number cannot be more than this, right? In all other cases, so whether it is between coming from this plus cluster one or cluster two, it doesn't matter what the other edge values are, they are coming from the same distribution, so you, all of them will go, only these two will stay. Therefore, this tensorizes and you will have something like this. So whatever is the size of the cluster and then the difference between these two. And since we have taken the size of the cluster to be one over h square, this will cancel and you will get some value which is less than 0.5. And so the constants doesn't matter. So since the total variation distance is small, with positive probability, this clustering cluster should be indistinguishable. So this is, uh, so far this is standard. So we can, we can do, we, we plan to use this type of argument. The problem, the main te technical challenge that comes on our way is that uh, it's a interactive randomized algorithm. So we basically have to show that at some stage, we still have to make such kind of hypothesis testing, right? So what we show is that there exist about order of k small cluster, so we use some kind of repeated PGN holding to show something like this. There exist 
uh, order of t small prop that says that probability of a query involving, so under any fixed hypothesis, probability of a query involving each of these clusters is small. So you have a new point that has to be assigned to a cluster, but since your query budget is limited, the probability of a query involving any of these clusters is going to be small. And under that fixed hypothesis, the probability of assigning to each of these cluster is also small. So whether an assignment would be made, looking at only the similarity matrix, that probability is also small. Now, uh, there are about, so since there are omega of k small cluster, and each small cluster has size 1 over h square, there are about k over h square elements in this small cluster. And now, they are kind of ambiguous. You will not be able to uh, find out the assignment of these points based on the similarity matrix. So you have to make all the queries possible with this, this points. So each of them has to make like say k, k minus 1 query. So you end up making this k square over h square query. So that's the basic proof idea of this. Okay? So this this thing is, this is actually, this takes some time to prove and it comes from, the idea is, goes back to this multi, multi unbanded lower bound by case of Bianchi um, and others where they have to, uh, they do something similar. Right, so that's the lower bound. What about the upper bound? How, how would the algorithm work? Um, so this, I'm um, giving you the Monte Carlo algorithm. So for now, uh, okay. So let's let's uh, let's assume that we again looking at the assignment problem. We have an element B, and we are looking at a cluster C, and we want to know whether to assign this point to this cluster or not. Right now, we have the similarity value. Now, what we do is we make we calculate two empirical distribution from the similarity value. One is the inter distribution, other is the intra distribution. What is the interdistribution? Basically, we look at all of the edge values from this point to this cluster, and then we just look at the histogram of that. <coughs> so that's the interdistribution. And then we look at all the points that are within this cluster, and then we look at the uh, histogram of the similarity values for that. Right? Now, if these two distributions are close enough, if they're close, then we know that there's a chance, there's a high chance that these points actually belong to this cluster. And if they are different, then we say that, okay, this point doesn't belong to uh, this cluster. Okay, so that's the intuition. Right, so we define something called the affinity of this vertex B to this cluster C. Right, and basically uh, that affinity is nothing but minus a negative Hellinger difference, the divergence between these two distributions that we have computed. Right? So if the affinity is large or the membership is large, we will just assign it to this cluster. Now, by using... Uh, so you have sequential, sorry, maybe it's a nice question. Uh, you do that all the, you have to do all the clusters, right? Because it may be possible that you have affinity which is large for one, and then even get affinity for something else. Right, right. So I'm just coming to that point right now. If you have cluster sizes uh, of size at least this, if the cluster C that you have computed has size is 16 log n divided by Hellinger divergence between s plus and s minus, then you can show just by using something like some repeated application of Sanov theorem, uh, you can show that this membership, suppose the point actually comes from C, then there would be some other cluster that would have a greater membership has very low probability. Okay. Yeah, it's not exponential. No, it will not get exponential. The the reason is that we are yeah uh, yeah you will not get exponential. The re, the, it's actually exponential. You see, this is only log n. That's why. So if it were n, it would be exponential. It's just just that's how we do things. Right. So as long as you are growing the clusters about logarithmic in size, you can just compute this membership and be done with it, right? But it's not only log of that, you also have this Hellinger divergence, right? But we, uh, what we want to design is an algorithm which is parameter-free. 
So how do you know that the clusters that you have formulated are large enough or so that you can now just look at the compute the empirical distribution and assign points? So that's actually the parts of being parameter free. You don't even know this, right? So what we do is kind of an iterate and estimate type of algorithm. So we choose like for some constants, we, uh, it's basically suppose we choose four login points and make all queries among them, all possible queries, and then we cluster. Okay. And based on these clusters and similarity matrix, we learn two empirical distribution, this P plus and P minus. Okay. Since we don't know what is F plus and F minus. Now we have, we come up with a new element B and the largest cluster C. We want to see if the similarity values indicate that the inter-distribution is close to F plus or F minus, but we don't know if we have enough points in C, right, to make a decision. We need at least 16 log n divided by the Hellinger square. So instead what we will just see is that whether the size of C is 16 log n divided by Hellinger square between P plus and P, P minus, the two empirical things that we have estimated, right? If yes, good. Right? If no, then um, if no, then what we do is we sample some more points and do this procedure again. Okay. So we'll just go on doing this, and now we once so we have this second like second order estimate of p plus and p minus. We compute this theta two, which is sixteen log n divided by the Hellinger divergence between plus 2 and p minus 2. And we see whether the size of c is now more than that or not. If yes, then we are good. If not, we sample more points and then we estimate this theta 3. And we go on doing this. So what we were able to show that this process actually converts pretty quickly. And that's our Monte Carlo algorithm. It's completely parameter free. And the total query complexity is k square log n divided by the Hellinger square. Yes? Given any number of queries so far, you, can you generate a confidence interval that your algorithm has converged? Or, uh, uh, what we can show, uh, um, no, actually, no. If you, if, we, if you stop me in the middle, I will not be able to tell you that whether I have done this much good. I, no, we don't have results like that. Some generalization uh, could go on for a very long time. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, what sense? So, so now it becomes an expected number of, as averaged over the possible WMA sampling, expected number of expected number of queries. Yes. Like. And uh, if the size hasn't reached that threshold, then we just choose these samples. Choose some more. Yeah, it will, it will be chosen and yes. Uh, third point is kind of redundant over here, so in this algorithm stage. Like I, I just wrote something that I told, told you before. Right, so you just, so you are, you don't know F plus and F minus, so that's the bottom line anyway. Okay, so we could make it work suitably, and we have the upper bound, the Monte Carlo algorithm, which is parameter free. Right, so we actually like, did experiments on the, with this algorithm on real data sets. We have some bibliographic data sets, and um, right, so I'm, again, I'm not going into the detail of the thing. So this precision and recall is nothing but like the, it's, uh, it's another name for false positive and false negative. And uh, so we took a data set that has about, uh, I don't know how many, so this is 16 million pages, but with only 16 million, like 1.6 million, 1.7 million pages. And with about 1136 queries, we achieved this much precision, this much recall. <laughs> this many possible pages, yeah. So number of nodes is 
1879. <coughs> okay. Right, now, can we specialize this for the case of stochastic block model where F plus is Bernoulli this, F minus is Bernoulli this, and we the clusters are of same size, same size. Each of them has size n over k. Um, so our conjecture is recovery is possible as long as square root of k and minus square root of b is greater than square root of k times one minus q divided by n k, where q is the total number of queries that you are asking. So uh, how we could prove some part of this conjecture, but we couldn't prove this entirely. So this is an open question that some of you might want to look at. So, so suppose you say again, you are given the stochastic block model matrix, and now you are querying. As long, so we are claiming that as long as square root of a minus square root of b is greater than this. So what happens when q equals to n k? That means you um, you ask all queries then there is no constraint here whatsoever. And what happens when q equals to zero, that is no queries are asked, then this bound reduces to the standard stochastic block model threshold, the square root of a minus square root of b greater than square root of k. Okay, makes sense. Now, uh, how, how long do I have? Uh, five more minutes. In the, for the five more minutes, we'll talk about the faulty oracle scenario. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> right. So, forty oracle again will give you some uh, some wrong answers. So, suppose uh, for for analyzing this case, suppose we do not have um, do not have the side information anymore, um, or we do not have any similarity matrix. We can ask queries to the to the oracle, but the oracle can give give us a wrong answer with probability p. Um, so we are not allowing resampling. So you cannot ask the same question to the oracle multiple times, and each time it is giving you wrong answer with probability p independently, and then you can aggregate because that is, for one thing, not theoretically interesting because with log n, asking the repeating it log n times, you will be basically reducing it to perfect oracle, uh, and it is also not practical. So if you ask the same question, you cannot um, assume that. Uh, you are getting wrong answers independently. So that simply doesn't work. Uh, it has been shown that that model is not good, so we are not allowing resample. <coughs> right, so if we make all n choose two queries, then our problem is basically reduces to the stochastic block model thing. We have the stochastic block model matrix. And, uh, However, without the prior probabilities, so then this, this is called uh, ML estimation is called correlation clustering, which is basically maximizing the total number of positive intercluster edges plus total number of negative intercluster edges. I think this should be minus. This should be plus. So whatever are the algorithm result, algorithmic results that we give for this faulty oracle are in terms of this ML recovery. So if we, because there are situations where we will not be able to recover at all. I will just show you those, uh, one of those kind of situations. And this is a generalization of the stochastic block model in a different way. So here we are just given the stochastic block model matrix, but not entirely. And I can ask you for entries of the stochastic block model, as if so it's a space bounded stochastic block model. So I can adaptively ask entries from the stochastic block model matrix, and my aim is to recover by, making my, by asking minimum number of queries. Right, so here is the example that I was talking about where it is indistinguishable. So suppose I have instances like this, two points in one cluster, one in here, and then one point in a cluster, and two in here. Right, so in these two clustering instances, it is hard to distinguish for the, from the quality oracle, the high probability, right, because we are not allowing resampling. So if you are making an error, the error will stay. So our lower bound is pretty strong because it actually, it is not limited to this type of situation. <coughs> so even if you have a balanced clustering, the input is, <coughs> instance is balanced, even then our lower bound works. So what is our lower bound? The lower bound says that, okay, if there were 
So this is again without side information. The actual lower bound was nk. Now we are saying it is going to be nk divided by this Jensen-Shannon divergence, which is like something like Kale divergence between p and q. And then upper bound is nk log n divided by Again, there is a factor of log n into the gap divided by 1 minus 2 p squared. So now, um, so this is the case when we have asymmetric errors. So the lower bound goes for asymmetric. Our algorithm only works when the error is symmetric. So the faulty oracles have the same error probability when there is an edge and when there is not. And we cannot, couldn't extend this for the case of asymmetric as of now. I don't think I have much time, but are the, is the result clear? But I have all the time that has to be taken from your lunch, I guess. Okay, so the upper bounding, um, so except for this, we have other result as well. So this is query complexity, and here we have not talked about the computational complexity, and, uh, but the computational complexity is not polynomial time, it's quasi-polynomial time if we want to achieve this, this, uh, this thing within log n factor of the information theoretic bound. If we want polynomial, time, polynomial running time, then our query complexity increases. It goes from nk log n to nk square log n. Um, and again, this is like the planted flip conjecture. If the planted flip conjecture were to be true, then you cannot improve on this running time. That is something we can prove. It's not very difficult to prove, actually. All right. Now, if you're curious about non-adaptive algorithm, we have something. So for k equals to two case, we can have n log n divided by one minus two p to the power four queries, and n log n runtime. For general k, you have r n k log n divided by one minus two p square queries, and for polynomial runtime, it has to, it will go from this one minus two p whole square will go from one minus two p to the power four. And capital R is that's actually the only difference between um, between this number and here. So from adaptive to non-adaptive. So this R is the ratio between the largest cluster and the smallest cluster, sizes of the largest and the smallest cluster. <laughs> No, so here you don't have, so for the case of, so this is achievability result, right? Algorithmic result, so, yeah. So if you are doing adaptive, it wouldn't matter, but if you are doing non-adaptive, all the queries at the same time, and it's not really random queries. For the non-adaptive as well, you have to do something more than just randomly querying things. Again, we did experiment it on a number of real data sets. It's was doing well. There is also this uh, conjecture for space bounded stochastic block model. Here we are saying that recovery is possible as long as the square root of a minus square root of b, and this is only for non adaptive queries. Suppose you do ask q number of non adaptive queries. So if q were to be n choose 2, that means you made all the queries, then this will again reduce to square root of a minus square root of b uh, greater than equals to square root of k. So if q were n choose 2, which is about n square over 2, 2, 2 will cancel, n, n will cancel, and you will have square root of k. But, but because you are asking some now, uh, you are asking less than that, so this is going to become stringent and stringent. But we, could, we couldn't prove this one as well. We could only prove this partially. Right. So in conclusion, many variation of the problem is possible. Most are open. An interactive learning algorithm are most useful. They are of interest and are of demand. Um, this talk was based on these two papers, query complexity of clustering with side information and clustering with noisy queries. We have some other works on this topic, uh, recent papers there, including one on this geometric block model where we address this triangle type of questions. And anyway, so you can feel free to check out those papers. Thank you.